In this episode, I'm joined by Dr. Ian Wickramasekra, Burn Buddhist practitioner and Associate Professor of Mindfulness-Based Transpersonal Counseling at Naropa University. We learn how a divination from a Tibetan master radically challenged the direction of Ian's life and how he encountered the man who would later become his teacher, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche. Ian recounts how on an intense Tumo meditation retreat, he attained to the Dzogchen spiritual realization known as Rigpa and its profound consequences in his life. Ian also discusses how he uses energy practices such as Tsalung and Tibetan yoga in his clinical practice to treat personality problems, substance abuse, and more. So without further ado, Dr. Ian Wickramasekra. Dr. Ian Wickramasekra, welcome back to the podcast. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. So you left us on quite a cliffhanger. Yes. Uh, the last time, uh, which uh, you just left the Shambhala organization. You found out about a, a Lama who, could, who offered divinations of various kinds. That's uh, that right. Led, that led to quite a series of interesting events. Please uh, put us out of our misery. <laughs> <laughs> okay, certainly I will. Uh, and here, let me say uh, that uh, this was around the year 2000 when this was all happening. Um, and so, so where we sort of left off, like as you're saying, I had made the decision that uh, I couldn't continue in the Shambhala lineage if I wanted to study the higher uh, Tantra and Dzogchen uh, teachings. And uh, I just didn't feel like the Sakyan could be uh, my teacher. And um, so I was very disturbed by this. Uh, it had actually never occurred to me that I might ever leave the Shambhala lineage. Uh, I was very satisfied with the teachings at the Hinayana and Mahayana level. And I had met a wonderful Kalyana Mitra and Robin Kornman. Um, but everything that I had been studying with him intensively for about 10 years had prepared me for this moment where I, I wanted to study with a guru. I really wanted to practice the traditional teachings uh, as they were taught traditionally and enter the lineage with uh, great respect and uh, practice Nundro and all of these things. You know, I was really wanting to do all of them. And then uh, it was, <clears throat> you know, really uh, confusing when uh, I realized uh, I was really uh, not going to be able to study with the Sakyong and I didn't know what to do. Uh, and so um, I asked my friend, uh, Robin Kornman, you know, it was such a powerful member of the Shambhala lineage, uh, what he thought I should do. And um, he said, you know, it's really fine. You know, why don't you continue uh, practicing meditation uh, at the center and, you know, doing the Dharma practice you like with the Shambhala lineage. And uh, around that time, I had started <clears throat> helping out as uh, being a meditation instructor in that lineage and also, um, you know, uh, helping lead uh, the, uh, you know, small retreats and things like that. And um, so, you know, I had a gratitude for what that lineage had taught me. Uh, I continue doing that. And um, so it seemed like I had a good base, you know. So I wasn't so freaked out like it was like, oh, it was Shambhala or nothing. Uh, Robin helped me to find a way that I could continue uh, deriving the benefit I had gotten from it, uh, but then keep looking for another teacher. And then, you know, he kept <clears throat> introducing me to teachings that were around this question, like, how, how should you pick a teacher, you know? And uh, so he actually introduced me to writings from Chagyam Trungpa himself about what he thought the proper qualifications for a teacher were. So it was just, everything was put me at this place where I really had a good conceptual and kind of personal understanding about how I should be looking for and, and um, picking a teacher that uh, fix a, uh, fits for me. Uh, but the teacher was not arriving, <laughs> you know? I was like, oh no, what am I supposed to do? And uh, Robin says, well, you know, you just gotta do what everyone else does. Just get out there and start meeting some teachers. And he suggested uh, Namki Norbu, which uh, at the time, <clears throat> Namki Norbu was uh, coming um, fairly frequently to the United States, particularly to, he had a group in, I think it was in the Boston area of Massachusetts. 
And so I just kept looking for opportunities. Maybe I could meet him. And then uh, the same guy that had been running these uh, Rime retreats in uh, uh, Chicago, uh, Roberto Sanchez, uh, brought a particular uh, Lama from the Nyingma lineage uh, called uh, Lama Dawa Chodrak. Uh, Lama Dawa Chodrak Rinpoche, who had studied with uh, Dajum uh, Rinpoche quite a bit, and Dilgo Kense, and uh, many other teachers, <clears throat> particularly in the so-called uh, the um, what's known as the Northern Treasures lineage. And uh, so uh, I thought, okay, you know, he's coming. Why don't I go and see him? You know, and uh, so I went, and uh, I I loved his talk and I loved his style. He he gave just basic uh, meditation talk and uh, then he offered like a more extensive retreat uh, later that weekend. I didn't feel that I was ready for it. But one of the things that he did say was that he was available for uh, consultation and that if you wanted to meet with him personally, you could. And uh, I learned through one of his uh, close students, whose name I believe is Terrence, he's a really wonderful man, uh, that Lama Dawa was capable of performing uh, mirror divinations for people. And um, I was like, what is mirror div divination? I never heard this thing. I maybe heard of like the Nanching Oracle, you know, from uh, the Dalai Lama's lineage. And so I thought, well, maybe it's something like this, you know, and, and I asked uh, Terrence, would it be okay if I asked Lama Dawa about, you know, finding a teacher, you know? And he said, oh, certainly, you know, Rinpoche would like to do this. And actually he does this for many people, you know, and I was like, oh, great, you know. So I, I set up a time to meet with him and, uh, uh, and he, you know, it was just as much I enjoyed his presence uh, when I saw him give talks. Uh, he immediately greeted me and uh, his wife uh, was sort of functioning as a translator and a scribe. And they kindly uh, gave me a cassette tape uh, and they recorded the entire thing, which I still have uh, from sometime like in October 2000 or something like that, where I uh, asked Lama Dawa a number of questions. And the first question that I asked him actually wasn't this question about a teacher. It was actually about um, something which I have asked all my close teachers uh, for their opinion and permission would it be okay for me to study the Dharma and then um, to try and understand the Dharma and uh, produce writings around the tradition of psychology? Because I had uh, interest uh, even from these very early days by nature of my life and experiences that I was wanting to try and find opportunities to build bridges of understanding between the Dharma and psychology. But I was also very, um, keen on honoring the lineages of uh, Tibetan Buddhism and Bun you know, that I ended up studying. Um, so I did not want to do something uh, which would be uh, offensive to the tradition and that would be considered uh, not good. So I asked every single teacher <laughs> this question. And actually he was the second teacher I asked this question to. Uh, but he immediately thought this was a good idea and, and gives permission and uh, began uh, to do some divinations for me. Uh, and so there's a long puja that he did, maybe, well, to me, it was long at the time. I think it was like 20 minutes and not really long puja now, I know. But at the time I was like, wow, you know, whoever saw such a thing, you know, and it was really beautiful. You know, I, I learned later that he had studied uh, and done an intensive uh, retreat in a cave uh, for many years to learn how to do this practice in uh, a dark cave. And, uh, and so he uh, uh, not only answered that question, but then put me on a very interesting path. <laughs> very, very interesting path. And so uh, he said many things uh, during that time, but one which I had not even asked for was he immediately told me that in a previous life, um, I had been a monk in a monastery called a Trak Trekker Dashi Ding in Sikkim, which is in a very remote part of Sikkim. Although at the time I didn't know that. <laughs> it was back, I never heard, I heard of Sikkim, but I never heard of no, 
Chakradashi Ding. I certainly never heard of the monk uh, name. He said that my name had been uh, J. Jigme Dorje, I guess like a Geshe Jigme Dorje. And uh, so that was uh, my name. And he just said these things sort of matter of factly. And then he told me that I would uh, go on in this life to be of much benefit if I followed this path. That if I follow this path of trying to study the Dharma traditionally and then uh, you know, keep practicing as a psychologist and try to understand these perspectives and produce scholarship and writing on them, that uh, this would bring uh, benefit to many, many beings is what he told me. And so I was like, oh, you know, this is not only am I not naughty, I might do something good by this. This sounds good, you know. Uh, and uh, then uh, he went on uh, with a little more questioning by me to tell me uh, after doing another divination that um, my guru would be not be Namki Norbu, but would actually be someone that's very much like Namki Norbu. And so his advice was to aim to immediately try and go and study with Namki Norbu. And maybe in that effort, I would meet my teacher. And so I was like, oh, thank you very much. You know, and I really kind of focused on that part of it and on his permission to bring uh, Dharma and psychology together in different ways. Uh, and I didn't actually think too much about the Trekker Dashi Ding or J. Jigme Dorje or anything like that. Um, I didn't even actually do like a Google search <laughs> or anything like this, you know. Actually, Google didn't exist back then, so I would have had to use uh, Yahoo or something. Uh, I, or like, what was it, Microsoft Excite or something. Uh, but I didn't even think that. I was just so happy what he had said and uh, really uh, went back to my good spiritual friend, Robin Kornman, and told him what had happened. And he thought, indeed, that was promising. Uh, he also didn't say too much about the Trekker Dashi Ding or uh, Northern Treasures lineage or anything like this. Um, but, uh, you know, he said, this sounded like good advice. Why didn't I follow it? And also he had already told me that maybe Namki Norbu would be good. So it seemed, everything seemed aligned. And uh, so I uh, started to, to really uh, try to meet uh, Namki Norbu. Uh, and at this time I had moved to, uh, temporarily to the Philadelphia area of Pennsylvania. Uh, I was um, uh, doing an internship in psychology, my clinical psychology internship. It was the last thing I needed to do to get my uh, doctorate. And so I'm there. And uh, another, uh, by uh, quite auspicious uh, circumstance, uh, also Chagda uh, Tokyo Rinpoche came to Philadelphia that year and I got a chance to meet him before he die and pass on, that was very nice. Um, but uh, I kept you know, trying to find a, a connection to Namki Norbu, but as it happened uh, in the year that I was in Philadelphia and not so far away from Massachusetts, uh, I was not able to meet Namki Norbu, but I kept like searching, you know? Uh, and then by coincidence, I noticed that uh, there was another teacher like Namki Norbu that I was very much uh, attracted to his lucid dreaming teachings. And uh, I didn't know much about him other than I had seen his uh, book uh, advertised in um, a Snow Lion uh, newsletter, which we talked about last time. And uh, so I knew his, you know, Snow Lion had published his book, so there's probably a good chance this is uh, someone of some good quality and uh, that they considered a real lineage holder. And uh, so, uh, and the, his name was Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche. And uh, now his, what I didn't quite understand was that he was a practitioner of Bun, and uh, Bun, uh, as he calls uh, Bun Buddhist lineage. And um, I remembered a little bit, you know, like in some of the Kaju teachings, uh, particularly some of the Kaju sadhanas, there's these lines like, may we not ever stray into the Bun. And uh, so I kind of thought like this bun was like badness, you know, <laughs> it's like something like really bad. And, uh, and it, I, I didn't know, you know, what to think about that, but um, I wanted to follow this advice, you know, that I should aim. And here was someone that, you know, I was aiming to meet Namki Norbu and suddenly he came into the picture. So I thought, what the heck? And uh, I had the time 
uh, to go to a, a week-long retreat with Tenzin Namgyal Rinpoche on lucid dreaming. And I thought, what the heck, I'll just do this. Uh, I had a lot of lucid dreams uh, growing up, naturally. And uh, so I thought, oh, this is be so wonderful. You know, now I have this good basis in practicing uh, shamatha and shine meditation. I uh, feel like I could really do this and uh, respected the lineage in terms of what I had been told at the time. It was very important to kind of uh, proceed gradually along the path. And, and at about 10 solid years of, uh, you know, really meditating and studying uh, uh, Hinayana, Mahayana. And so I thought, this is good. And, uh, but, you know, where do I find this person? This really looking, looking. And uh, so I signed up for this retreat, which happened to be in August of 2001 in um, uh, this place called the Omega Institute in Rhinebeck, uh, New York. They have lots of teachings, uh, all kinds of teachers go through there. And um, I bought uh, uh, Rinpoche's book uh, prior to the retreat and read it and absolutely loved it. Uh, I loved it for so many reasons. Uh, I found his uh, description of his practice was very rich so that you could actually get a sense about how lucid dreaming was practiced. Like, uh, and that's one of the things to this day, I just love so much about Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche. He has a mind that's very, very vast for theory and these kinds of things. If you ask him a question about that, you will get some very detailed answers. Uh, However, uh, in his teachings, he always emphasized practice. So uh, it was wonderful. Here was someone that could like really describe like how you do these things, you know, it's uh, not just the theory of it, but actually, you know, the, the theory or the, the view of the mind, you know, but really talking about where that view meets the practice. And then what do you specifically do step by step to make these things happen? It's just filled with all kinds of rich, uh, deeply personal practice uh, recommendations. He just emanate from him continuously. And uh, he also had this kind of, uh, I would say a little bit of a kind of a attitude of the skepticism that I love so much about uh, Chagyam Trungpa Rinpoche's writings and that he seemed skeptical of people who uh, didn't have their uh, view informed by their personal practice, not just reading the practice of others, but you must discover for yourself. And um, so I go, I just got that from the book. And then uh, I go to meet him and it was exactly like that. And, uh, you know, sometimes people talk about the times that they meet their gurus, you know, special feelings arise and this kind of special results arise and this kind of thing. And it was true that actually the first time that uh, I entered a room where he was sitting on this big shrine and uh, I was uh, doing what I uh, had done in the Shambhala lineage. We have a way of uh, bowing to the shrine. It's kind of, you know, traditional Buddhist way when you first enter and this kind of thing. And anytime you cross the center area where the teacher is and this kind of thing. So I'm doing all these bows and prostrations and things. And uh, I just had this deeply uh, rich kind of beautiful feeling and it felt very nice and we sat down and he started to expand upon the practices of lucid dreaming from a traditional Tibetan perspective and it was just like in the book and um, I began uh, doing uh, you know all these uh, practices during the day and then at night you know he would try to see if some you know results would arrive you know and so actually at this retreat, I was a little less uh, uh, crazy than I was in my earlier days thinking that I'm, I might get enlightened immediately or something like that. Uh, and I would just be happy if I would have one lucid dream during the week. I was hoping maybe that would happen. And instead every night I had very powerful lucid dreams and uh, results arrived immediately. And uh, he made himself available to uh, at the end of uh, every day uh, for many hours. He would let anyone come and do a personal uh, meeting with him. He would just stay on the throne he'd been teaching on all day. And then uh, you could wait in line and he would talk to you uh, very generously for a long, long time. And during that retreat, um, he demonstrated to me a kind of non-duality uh, around how he gave those teachings that really made me feel that he had a lot of realizations of these practices. Uh, 
And he was willing to work with my personal circumstances. And this was something that Robin Kornman and also what I had gotten from reading Chaga and Trungpa's guidelines about how to find a teacher and select a teacher was that uh, even Trung Chaga and Trungpa says even very directly, the, the guru must speak your language. And um, so that they're an incredibly adaptable person. You know, the guru not force you to treat them you know, in this kind of idealistic way, but will actually work with who you really are. And so um, I brought to uh, Tenzin Wangyal a question, which was um, that most of my life, uh, not so much uh, then, but throughout most of my life, uh, I had really struggled with this social anxiety. You know, I, I had really made a big break from that long time before, which I described last time. And so, uh, you know, now I have the energy of anxiety, but not so much the thoughts. And that, that energy is wonderful. Actually, it keeps me alive and present. I actually really enjoy it, uh, this energy of anxiety. It's actually quite helpful. It's like a full cup of coffee, no problem, you know, <laughs> available at any time. Uh, but I asked to him uh, uh, that I had a little concern about one of the techniques that he is uh, uh, teaching for just for me personally. And that was that as you went out, went out through the day, that you should try to connect with the dreamlike nature of reality. And I really loved that idea a lot because it really related to many of the experiences I already had up to that point, which I mentioned uh, last time, particularly with the experience of holding an orange and you know being strangled to death and all this. Uh, and um, uh, I had wondered a little bit uh, through my meditation practice if I had gone too strong in that direction, like I was, you know, sort of like a nihilist, you know, I'd gone into the sort of nihilistic thing that felt a little uh, dark and spooky to me. And so connecting with that and just saying, uh, wh what was it he wanted to say? Yeah, just like we say in the <laughs> Western uh, Stephen LeBerge tradition, you know, like saying throughout the day this is a dream, this is a dream, you know, this is a dream, and connect with this dream-like nature that way, like this moment right now, this is dream. And uh, now this feels good to me, but I was a little spooky about this, like maybe what would happen, you know, <laughs> could something bad happen as a result of this? So I asked him, you know, uh, um, this bothers me a little bit. I've had trouble with dissociation in my life. This bothers me. And then uh, he then asked, what do you mean dissociation? And so uh, then I explained for like, you know, five, 10 minutes about hypnosis and dissociation. And the entire time, you know, he's smiling and interested and in asking more questions about my understanding of hypnosis and dissociation. And also bringing it back to why I was concerned, you know, just bringing it back to what might be wrong with the practice. And so he, he sat there and, and uh, took his time and thought about everything that I'd said to him. And then he said uh, something which really uh, made me feel uh, deeply uh, respected and honored. Uh, he said, you know, uh, in, our in our tradition, this is what we would do. We would say, this is a dream. You know, this is a dream. And so from the perspective of the tradition and honoring it, I would say, you know, why don't you try working with that? But then he smiled and said, but you know, on the other hand, you know, it's very important that you uh, work with the teachings as yourself. And so he actually then said to me, uh, what, I would, what I would like for you to do is to do the opposite and see what happens, you know, for, uh, during the retreat, like do the opposite. And I say, like, well, what do you mean? <laughs> you know, the opposite. You can say, this is a real this is real, this is real, this is real, you know? And, and it says, that's not the, the traditions, but I feel like uh, given what you have said, I think it will be good for you to try this. So why don't you try this and come back and tell me what happens, you know? And so then I did. Uh, and, but you know, more than what he said being important, it was really the fact that he had the empathy, compassion, and, uh, a firm grasp on the view 
of uh, the nature of mind that allowed him to do this kind of experiment with me and to like really work with me in particular and that he was really welcoming and uh, would speak my language of psychology if I would only explain a little to him and uh, I just found like wow this guy is so able to speak my language and work with my exact circumstances that he would even say to do this you know the opposite of what he was really doing and so I went off and did that and then strangely enough I found like the same kind of thing was happening whether I said this is a dream or this is real it was all about uh, kind of connecting to the this quality of grasping to reality you know that was really more about that than thinking about some subject object split you know uh, and um, that actually I didn't if I understood saying this is a dream in that way and not just understood at a conceptual level because I think it's really more the a dualistic conceptual level that was upsetting me about that and that actually I could just I could just freely participate in the dream and uh, but realize it's dreamlike nature and not have to be particularly disturbed by the dreamlike nature of myself or disturbed by the dreamlike nature of reality you know another way of thinking of that is not be disturbed by the emptiness of self not be disturbed by the emptiness of uh, reality or experience of reality so to speak um, and so uh, I was just so grateful at the end of that retreat. And there, had, there was no question in my mind that here was a teacher that had a high degree of realization, was willing to work with me as I was and had done so for every day for an entire week. Uh, and uh, also I learned that he had a retreat center in uh, Virginia, which I could travel to and offered an extensive uh, one month retreat, uh, or maybe it was, was it one month? Yeah, it was one month retreat uh, every summer. and. Uh, they were very open. You could attend one week, two weeks, three weeks, or the whole thing. And so I thought, wow, this could really be a path. Um, well, I wanted to go back and uh, check this out with my friend, uh, Robin Kornman. He had been my Kalyana Mitra and see what he would say. And uh, he immediately loved the idea. And it turned out that actually he himself, after Trungpa had died and, and Dilgo uh, Kensei had died, had wanted to study with uh, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche's uh, teacher, who was a teacher who's still alive, actually, I think he's about 95 years old. Uh, his name is Yangzen Rinpoche. And so uh, even His Holiness the Dalai Lama has taken teachings from him. And uh, so Robin said, oh, this is very exciting. I know uh, this Tenzin Wangyal, I regard very highly. I think this would be good for you. Uh, why don't you do that, you know, even uh, my, he wanted to study with uh, his uh, teacher. And um, so I felt very relieved, particularly I brought up this thing that, you know, in the Shambhala, not Shambhala teachings, but in some of the Kaju teachings, they say, you know, may, may we not strain to the bone. And so then I said to Robin, am I gonna go to Vajra hell or something? You know, I was going studying at this, uh, you know, perversion of the Dharma, you know, this kind of thing. And I says, oh no. And then he just laughed, laughed, laughed very hard. And he said, actually, Ian, uh, there is a lot of bone teachings in the Shambhala teachings. Uh, I didn't know this at the time, but uh, it turns out that a lot of the origin of Shambhala teachings have to do with a teacher of Rime called a Mifam uh, Rinpoche, who had studied bone quite a bit. Uh, I think maybe even started off as bone. I don't remember the full progression, but had studied bone. And so there are many bun practices in the Shambhala uh, tradition, even though it's not always openly said very much. And uh, so he said, actually, this will be really good. You'll go and study in that lineage, and then even you'll be helpful to Shambhala lineage. You'll be able to offer good law song the way a bun practitioner does. And there are many other things he said, you know, that have to do with bun teachings around Dzogchen uh, that would be very, good for you to learn and maybe you could even be of some help to the Shambhala lineage down the road. And I was like, oh, you gotta be kidding me, you know? I, but I didn't actually at that point even fully understand what he was telling me other than he was someone I completely trusted and I 
you know, he translated the Shambhala, you know, term. Uh, so if he's saying this, uh, I knew that it was not going to be so bad, you know, or at least I trusted this, you know, that, uh, that someone at the very center of the Shambhala lineage in terms of translating its actual teachings, you know, word by word, that this, this was, uh, this was worthy of uh, doing, not worrying so much, and just go off and do that. And so I did. Uh, now, the other interesting thing was, um, around this time, I suddenly remembered that uh, one of Chagyam Trungpa's closest friends while he was alive was a Tibetan teacher. Uh, he, I think he lived mostly in London, so perhaps maybe you knew. Uh, his name is a Venerable Otto Rinpoche. Did you I've heard, heard? I've heard that name, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think uh, maybe he was one of the teachers that Trungpa and him had helped found Samye Ling uh, Monastery, I think, in Scotland. Uh, uh, but at any rate, they were very close friends and had left India at the same time. Um, I'm sorry, left Tibet around the same time and then uh, goes to India together. Um, and so, uh, because when I was in that lineage, um, you know, none of the really powerful teachers were left alive, you know. <laughs> Trungpa had died, Dogo Kensei had died, you know, other of the Kaju, uh, so-called Kaju princes had died. And uh, I was like, oh, no, you know. But then here, this guy was alive, you know. And so I wanted to take Buddha's refuge with him. And so uh, he came and I had a nice long, hour-long conversation with him before he gives me uh, refuge and I ask him the same question that I ask every Rinpoche you know like is this good that I try to bring Dharma and uh, psychology together and uh, it turned out that actually he works in mental health capacity he had worked as an orderly uh, just for a source of income you know uh, and to exercise kindness with very very uh, chronically mentally ill people and I ask him you know uh, what do you do to help these people. Like I imagine maybe he was teaching some powerful Vajrayana practice to psychotic folks. Uh, and he looked at me with this very gentle eyes and he said, no, no, I just wash their body. You know, I am orderly, I wash their body. And uh, the way that he said it, it was clear that he was actually through washing their body was attempting to comfort them at a very deep level not make them feel uh, self-conscious about it, but just bring direct benefit. And uh, and yeah, here is someone who is trained in the exact same way that Chagyam Trungpa was trained. Uh, even I, I knew that from reading uh, Born in Tibet, he mentions. Uh, and uh, I was like, wow, how is it someone is like at the very top of the Vajrayana training uh, is, doing such a simple and what we would normally think in you know the west is a very low thing like washing the body of another person hey he's like did this for decades you know <laughs> you know he didn't like attempt to be, rise to the top of psychiatry or something he actually went to the very bottom you know and made direct contact and wash the bodies and take care and that really provided a very powerful uh example to me of the humility involved in being uh you know, having some realization that uh, there's some kind of, I don't know, maybe non-dual humility or something. But uh, he then uh, went on to uh, say uh, that he thought it was really good that I try to bring Dharma and uh, psychology together. And um, when he gave me my uh, Dharma name, uh, he, he gave me the Dharma name I had never heard before. It was uh, Rigzin. And so... Uh, I asked my friend Robin Corman, what does this mean, Rigzin, you know? And then his eyes get a little wide and they say, oh, this, this, uh, <laughs> I really need to remain in contact with you. And I was like, what are you saying, Robin? Is this, a, this means wisdom holder. And then I laughed and I said, uh, oh yeah, I guess I am kind of a wise guy. And then he looked very seriously at me and said, there's only one kind of wisdom. I was like, oh, <laughs> I was like, okay, whatever. But uh, the strange thing that Otto Rinpoche did at that time was when he gives me this name, he also gave me this booklet 
uh, that was very nice and had some basic Dharma teachings in it. And he recorded the, he had this page in it for me. He said, here you can record all of your empowerments that you receive. And then he stopped and looked me uh, very closely in the eye and said, and even empowerments that you receive in other lineages. And I was like, uh, it was kind of, why did you say that, you know? <laughs> I was like, uh, I'm staying in this lineage forever is what I thought, you know? I mean, I hadn't met Sakyang or anything at this point, but I was so happy with the teachings. I never thought I would ever leave this lineage. But it was almost like he foresaw that this was uh, going to be the case. And uh, by giving me this wild name uh, also, I thought, you know, uh, what I was told was the name was to say something about the character of the strengths I would be working with. And so I didn't, I didn't certainly didn't feel that way myself, you know, uh, but, um, you know, it was actually really kind name to give uh, someone who, you know, had struggled with so much anxiety my whole life is a fairly empowering name. Um, at any rate, so put all those together, I started to think like, yeah, Otto Rinpoche must have foresaw this, you know, and uh, then uh, I just started studying just wholeheartedly in the Bun lineage and started, I now received permission from two different teachers uh, to begin studying Dharma and psychology. Also then I asked um, uh, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche, since that's who I was really working with, you know, what he thought of this. And he gave me on more than one occasion permission to do this. But actually I should mention that all three of these teachers and others that I later asked permission for too, uh, gave me the same heartfelt advice. Uh, Tenzin Wangyong and Rinpoche in particular had already had students that had asked him this question and that had already begun doing this kind of work. And so the advice that he gave me was uh, to uh, do this like you would a remay thing. Like you must study something thoroughly from its own perspective before trying to uh, bring something together. And also he requested uh, for me not to actually mix the Dharma and hypnosis uh, at this time. He said, you know, these, it's okay to talk about ideas and it's okay to uh, write about and compare these things, but not actually in terms of the practice, like not actually try to, for me to, like I was joking last time, become the first uh, Dharma hypnosis Rinpoche or something <laughs> like this, you know. Uh, Actually, there's some people that are getting pretty close to that, uh, that have high study, uh, high degree of um, participation in, shall we say, the hypnosis lineage and high degree of participation in the uh, Dharma lineages, um, like Dan Brown is one of them, for sure, uh, has done a lot of work and even uh, assist different Bun Rinpoche's in teaching uh, Zogchen. But I still myself don't feel like that's where I'm at, you know, but, but I'm very much into bringing things together and just the way the advice that they gave me, you know, like this will be a lot of benefit just bringing these ideas together and trying to build a bridge that will be of benefit to both uh, hypnosis uh, lineage and expanding its non-duality and, uh, and also opening, uh, like I'm doing, uh, the avenues of research for studying uh, you know, Dzogchen practices and reflecting on them from the point of view of the mind that has been revealed by hypnosis research. So, yeah, they actually provide uh, even dualistic evidence that many Dzogchen uh, uh, practices and uh, theories of mind uh, have actual, uh, you know, there's a way we can understand even things like the emptiness of self from a hypnotic perspective and using like real research, you know, uh, real dualistic research, not just phenomenological investigation, although that's no shortage, I mean, no substitute for that. You have to do that if you, you know, I feel at least in terms of personal uh, gain. So everything starts coming together around this time. Everything's just uh, amazing and exciting and uh, really enjoying and still enjoy very much to practice with Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche and he just opened the door of uh, Dzogchen uh, and other tantric related practices from the Bun, Mother Tantra and other uh, Kusum Rangshkar, other classic uh, uh, Bun Po 
meditation manuals, and I uh, I uh, also uh, received Nundro blessing from Tenzin Wangyal uh, Rinpoche originally, and began practicing the Nundro, and um, many wonderful things happened. Continue practicing uh, lucid dreaming and having really a uh, great experience of that and sort of uh, really helping me to get that experience of the dreamlike nature of self and reality. And, um, and also uh, they, he was the first one to really teach me Sa Lung practice, uh, re really trying to experience the kind of wisdom, inherent wisdom energies, you know, that we has within us. And that, that uh, eventually dovetailed around uh, or I know grew into a very powerful retreat that I had. I believe it was the summer of 2008 when Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche gave one of the first times ever in this country uh, a Tumo uh, yoga retreat on from the bone perspective. And so we did like a whole month of uh, Tumo. And I had read, been reading about Tumo you know, from ben, uh, Herbert Benson, you know, the famous professor of uh, medicine. Uh, he was the chief of cardiology, actually, at Harvard Medical School for a time. And so I read about it, you know, and from his studies with those uh, monks from, I can't remember what monastery they were, but they were, I think they were uh, uh, Galugpa lineage. And so I thought, oh, finally, you know, I get to do this. How wonderful, you know, and I have done uh, done Nundra practice and uh, to spend many years in uh, Shamatha and Shine and feel like this is uh, good. I can really do this and uh, he's encouraging me to do. And so uh, that, that was another kind of before and after moment for me was uh, that summer. Uh, in practicing Tumo, uh, you know, has a lot to do Sa Lung is a really great preparation for that because there's all kinds of powerful visualizations and uh, very powerful mantras, and, you know, repetition of sound and uh, very powerful uh, breathing and focusing on the chakras and energies, particularly the navel chakra is uh, very powerful uh, there, but you know, whole thing. And so like everything I learned is just building up to this uh, moment and uh, you know, already I feel like uh, we were, you asked me this great question last time about space, you know, what is the secret of space? And uh, a lot of uh, that I really, you know, got in the, you know, powerful glimpse through that first month long meditation retreat I had at Shambhala, uh, Rocky Mountain Dharma Center, now called Shambhala Mountain Center. And, um, so I had some sense of, uh, you know, how uh, lessening grasp on myself, lessening uh, grasp on, uh, you know, dreamlike nature of reality, uh, this produces space, this lessening grasp. Uh, but then uh, doing that Tumo practice, like powerfully opened that space so much more, so much more. And I had to have a, uh, I don't know how, how to say this, except just a more powerful experiential sense of that space through doing Tumo practice. And what ended up happening was uh, a very close friend uh, named Tony that uh, we were doing this practice together for the first time. And he was, his Dharma journey uh, was very similar to mine in terms of what stage he was at and his readiness to do Tumo and his uh, experience of devotion. So that uh, when the two more teachings weren't uh, going on, then him and I would actually, instead of like, we would have like a really quick lunch or, you know, maybe not even drink any tea during tea break. And we would just do prostrations like the whole time during that. It was just really super intense and uh, loving and opening to the lineage and uh, really uh, feeling uh, uh, the power of a guru yoga in particular, you know, through doing those prostration practice, you know, is, can really get that, you know, connecting with the uh, innate nature of mind through guru yoga. So wonderful. And uh, doing these prostrations. And then, and then we'd go back to the two more teachings, you know, so we was like practicing very, very thoroughly. And 
you know, sometimes like people would describe that like a discipline. And I think it is, of course. But to me, it was also, uh, I felt like this joy, you know, it was so amazing to be able to practice these teachings I had read about for a long time. And here was the opportunity and uh, connecting very deeply with this uh, Bun lineage and feeling uh, so comfortable and so accepted by it. And uh, even people in the Sangha, a lot of them are therapists. So that fit on that side of me a lot. Uh, no one ever say too much bad about uh, therapy other than what seems to be indicated, <laughs> you know, uh, and even an, another therapist would say. Uh, and so this just kept getting better and better and better. Uh, and in that Tumo retreat, uh, one day, um, I don't know, it was like the opening of, uh, I guess we we call here space, became so profound that uh, there was a, a, a break after the session of uh, this, uh, you know, the different stages of Tumo practice, uh, you know, w w the sort of, uh, there's one that's kind of like a, wrathful one that's sort of like a very powerful one to do very powerful breathing and you have very um mm, eh, very set physical position you do with your body and so we just finished doing this one they call the draklung and uh uh i don't know how long into the retreat this was maybe it was like i don't know two weeks or something i don't know it feels like it was near the middle and uh me and my good friend tony uh we just went uh, after the session was over and we just walked uh, over to, I think it was like a, uh, a swing actually or something. Uh, we just sat on this thing uh, and just uh, this sense of space was so profound. And I think this break was like maybe like an hour long or something, you know, and uh, Normally we were, you know, intensively going back into doing some other practice, you know, particularly guru yoga and uh, prostration practices. And, um, but we weren't, you know, <laughs> it's just like, we're just sitting there. And also we're not talking at all, even though there was no, you know, the silence prohibition for this retreat, actually. We were encouraged, you know, not to engage in, you know, uh, idle speech or something. But there's nothing saying you couldn't speak. It was not silent retreat. And uh, we're just sitting there and uh, enjoying each other's presence. And um, and suddenly it occurred to me, you know, like a whole hour had gone by. We really hadn't said anything, you know, to one another at all. And yet it felt like we had been sharing so much. Uh, and I just love this guy, Tony. He's uh, amazing. His name is uh, Tony Nassif. And... Uh, and I really uh, started to feel like how profound uh, this space could get, you know, and, and not even fully realizing it, it could really be um, like so profound and that actually I could feel so comfortable with myself and be so open uh, that, you know, I really started to understand this whole defending the self thing was you know, definitely not where it was at, even, you know, though there can be a good skillful means to have boundaries, you know, and this kind of thing, and good skillful means to, you know, work with your circumstances in the world, uh, that actually that was not really where it was at in, in, in an ultimate sense, you know, not needing to defend the self, not needing to defend my experience of uh, this dream of reality and, my, and protecting the circumstances, you know, of the world and relating to the world with grasping. I must defend, you know, uh, you know, my profession as a psychologist, you know, I must defend uh, this and that. No, <laughs> that is really like a Yangzen Rinpoche, leave it as it is. And uh, so that kind of spatial sense and uh, equanimity uh, really uh, had uh, most powerful experience that it never leave me, you know, since that moment. Uh, it was really wonderful sitting on this like swing thing. And uh, I think maybe it was broken, that's why I'm reluctant to call it a swing thing, but you could sit on it. Uh, and uh, 
just sitting there with the Tony and Nassif and uh, after months of, I'm not months, but weeks of practice. And uh, it was really wonderful. So uh, that really encouraged me to keep uh, working with Bon, which I do up until this day. Um, then around that time, now we come back to this arc of what Lama Dawa Chodrak did for me. When you say that it stayed with you, this equanimity, do you yeah. mean that you can bring it to mind or recall it uh, at will, or do you mean the sense that you've never left the same intensity or clarity of that state since that moment? Mm, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I guess it, right away what comes to the mind is uh, Tenzin Wangyal saying, space is always there. Only, uh, you know, space is always there. Space is always there. It will say this, you know, space is always there. And uh, that's how I feel. You know, it's like, uh, 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 I don't, I mean, it actually can be a little bit helpful, I feel like, in terms of, like, when I describe that memory, it does have a kind of natural way of reminding me that this space is always there. Because, um, indeed, like everyone else, I get rehypnotized, you know, back into the illusionist self and uh, grasping to this world. But still, uh, at a powerful level, I believe this, you know, de evolution of the self thing that actually this experience that I get rehypnotized back into, you know, every day I wake up, I guess, and <laughs> in different versions while I'm dreaming. Uh, there is a space that underlies all of that in a, a field of wisdom and love that, you know, connect all things. And that this illusion of self and this illusionary world arises from that. And, uh, but having, uh, I don't know what's the right word, maybe tasted this, you know, this space, experienced this space. That's the right way to experience this uh, and how it relates to this is goofy selves I keep putting on, you know, wearing thoughts, <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, it feels like that has, the awareness of that has not left me. I feel like space is always there. Um, and that brings me great comfort, actually, at times when I find my fixation on myself leads to painful points. Particularly, you know, someone does something that upsets me or something occurs in the world, which I feel is very sad. Um, and, you know, those things are very sad, you know, often uh, to my experience of, uh, of myself and my experience of the, the world. Uh, and yet, uh, there is a space that underlies that, that uh, I think often actually brings what's happening in um, less grasping on that brings better action on my point. So that and I'm not using the space to try. What I really don't want to do is to use that experience of space to negate the world. Because that was actually what I was afraid of when I said Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche. And then, then he says, you should say this is real, you know. Uh, which, by the way, I only did that for a couple of days. And then I said, I think this is a dream is fine. You know, I think I got the point. Uh, but the... Uh, so I feel like uh, remembering that, you know, space is always there, uh, doesn't space me out and I become numb to the suffering of myself and other people. Remembering that space is there gives me the, the actually, uh, paradoxically, the ability to draw closer to the suffering <laughs> and to draw closer to the suffering then brings it, makes it possible for that suffering to have its own experience of emptiness too, you know, that, uh, and nothing in this world, you know, is, is uh, eternal, you know. And yeah. so I feel like uh, bringing that space allows the natural impermanence of uh, suffering of, from the illusion and fixation on myself and uh, allowing that and drawing closer and opening that space uh, really in you know, an experience of emptiness really uh, allows these qualities to come more out without uh, actually uh, 
like what I used to do, like repress my anxiety, repress on my anger. Uh, these things dissolve of their own nature, like, uh, uh, you know, like into the vast expanse of the sky, you know, there's a lot of space in the sky. <laughs> and I'm curious if you think the Tumo practice directly led to that uh, experience, mm -hmm. the dawning of that experience. I've heard you mentioned Daniel Brown, Daniel P. Brown, yeah, uh, the psychologist and yes. Bern translator and teacher. Yeah, and he has referred to Tumo. One of the main purposes of Tumo uh, in the Bern way of mm -hmm. looking at things is purifying the karmic traces of the body. Yes, the phrase he uses. So I'm curious if you think that there was some direct relationship between the Tumo practice and this insight, or if it was just happened to be the practice you were doing at the time? Hmm. Well, um, you know, sometimes they talk about the spontaneous arising, you know. Um, so here, I think, you know, we've arrived at a firmly uh, non-dualistic phenomenon. So it's very important. Uh, we must think about how if we use dualistic language around it, it could lead to some potential misunderstandings. And also, uh, you know, I want to also probably better, I said this earlier, but any misunderstandings that I give of this, uh, they are my own and uh, any wisdom that I have to give, uh, there are testaments to my teachers, but any misunderstandings that anyone gets through me attempting to use uh, a dualistic language, or even though I'm trying not to, um, then I'm, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm sorry. And so you must discover these things for yourself. But actually what you're saying is a very profound question because I actually do think that Tumo did do something uh, to my uh, mind-body system as a whole. And here we reach a, one of the most powerful things about studying, I think, uh, for me, studying. So the Tumo practice that, that I study with Tenzin Wang Gyal Rinpoche uh, comes from a number of texts, but one which uh, Daniel Brown uh, also helped translate, it's called the Kusum Rangshkar, you know, and uh, so in that one, uh, they reveal the this powerful relationship between mind and body, which we have almost no understanding of at all, uh, which is like how uh, your central nervous system is not the whole thing. You know, it's like in psychology, only recently did people start looking at how the GI tract is involved as a part of the central nervous system. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really funny, like we, we've got glimpses into that for a long time. And this is, it's gonna sound a little like a digression, but I promise we'll get right back to the dharmic part of this. But I just want to point out that it actually is a uh, scientific way of understanding how working with your energy, your chakras could really bring benefit to your central nervous system. One of them is uh, we have known for a long time that ironically, uh, most of the benefit of antidepressant medication that accumulates uh, for people who have depression, if, if indeed you believe that is not just placebo, like my good er friend Irving Kirsch has demonstrated actually fairly convincingly, it could be mostly placebo, but some drug effect, at least even he says some, just very small. <laughs> uh, but let's just go purely with the theory, you know, for the sake of argument that it isn't placebo. Um, but um, one strange thing is, uh, it was found that if you actually, uh, people thought that if you added, you know, more drug effect with this, that uh, it's increasing, the theory is that antidepressants work by increasing the amount of available serotonin in, uh, in the brain. And so, you know, some really smart chemists thought, well, why don't we invent a, um, a drug coating you know, around the drug that will allow it to uh, pass through the GI tract without dissolving and will allow the transfer of more uh, chemicals that will allow the serotonin to be increased in the brain. And so um, <laughs> when they did this, you know, it, that meant that less serotonin would be, you know, potential chemicals would be released, uh, channel agonists would be available for the digestive tract, but, but no one cared about that. No one thought like, you know, 
who cares if you know the the central i mean the uh gi tract gets less uh of this uh agent uh but then it turned out that most of the benefit of this was lost when they used this very fancy drug coating, you know, so that uh, so much more serotonin was arriving to the brain and so much less to the GI tract. And so uh, then suddenly the benefit was gone. <laughs> you know, it's really paradoxical. Like they thought, well, how could this be that, you know, somehow the GI tract is, is helping people with depression? How, that's, we know, how could we understand that? You know, GI tract has nothing to do with depression. It's just about processing waste and, you know, and uh, deriving nutrients and things. And so this dualistic understanding of the mind and body is, that we have in neuroscience is totally fucked up, even from a scientific perspective. Uh, there are other things, too, I could go into, but that's probably one of the most funny things. Um, so in the, just as you were saying, Dan Brown uh, says, that text actually describes the relationship between our psychology and different uh, parts of, not necessarily parts, and energetic parts of our body. So it's, it's using that as a way of actually describing the mind-body relationship. And in particular, you know, like in Tumo, there are a number of chakras that we focus on. And one of them is, you know, <laughs> right over the GI tract, you know, it's really the, you know, navel chakra. And in particular, the energy there uh, is uh, said to have a fire-like nature. And Tumo is all about working with this fire and actually using this fire to um, purify our body. Now, this becomes something that's very hard for psychologists to understand. And this is where studying with Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche is fantastic because he goes into the deep, uh, uh, mm, psychological nature of this like you mostly you hear about you're just purifying the you know the different parts but uh, Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche talks about how did they get uh, defiled in the first place and the way he's, he talks about that is they get defiled by your karmic actions and so what are these karmic actions there are things like getting involved with anger there are like getting involved with uh, anxiety, depression, jealousy, that these things actually accumulate in, in the different energy centers of the body, you know, and they even correlate with the six realms of existence and this kind of thing. And so you get involved in the lethargic pleasures and that's the, the God realm, you know. Uh, I always think this must be like a heroin land or something, <laughs> you know, and, uh, or I don't know, maybe, I've never done ketamine, but maybe it would be like ketamine too, I don't know. Uh, and then, you know, like your throat, you know, this has to do with the jealousy and uh, the, uh, uh, you know, jealous demigod realms, you know, and the heart, this is the uh, human realm. And so uh, then also navel chakra. And so each of these has a, a specific kind of psychology and a specific kind of um, mm, our karmic actions then accumulate as blockages to these energy centers, which also have, uh, along with them, a specific kind of wisdom that's released when they're purified. And so uh, what Dan Brown said is pr profoundly true from my experience, even from a psychological sense, in that when you do these practices, you're working with the psychology, kind of psychology of our grasping to the self and the world in particular ways. And you use this uh, kind of liberated uh, fire, you know, this wisdom fire, like uh, Tenzin Wangal Rinpoche calls it the primordial fireball of wisdom, you know, like you work with this and it's going to burn away all the attachments uh, that, uh, sort of block the flow of wisdom energies in the body. So again, we have this uh, view that innately the mind and body are pure, like a crystal. Actually, it's described like that, like a crystal in many Dzogchen traditions, of course. And uh, it's like a crystal. And that uh, as you purify yourself in this way, then you are becoming like this, like a crystal and clear energy so wonderful so you i don't you don't have to particularly through the practice create 
inexperience as much as you you do the practice and uh, relate to uh, the inherent things that uh, happen not creating a self to experience uh, an expectation of what will happen but just do and uh, discover and so I feel like Tumo really uh, is so powerful in that it can not just make uh, uh, Tumo a very mm, Like Shine and Shamata feels more like here to me <laughs> because, you know, this has to do with speech and the thinking. And so working with thoughts and discovering uh, emptiness, you know, of self and dreamlike nature of reality here. But in Tumo, you're using all, you know, the energy centers, uh, all the chakras and uh, really working whole mind and body. I also think it's a little off to say that only the throat is involved with Shine and Shamatha, but at least for me, that was kind of where I was feeling that liberation if I go back, uh, that kind of realization, I guess. Um, and so, yeah, I think Dan is, is really on to that. And here I want to say, not many people who know about Dan know, uh, Dan was teaching hypnosis at a very high level, uh, possibly before I was born or not long after I was born and a very good friend of my father actually uh, and I even met him uh, his style of hypnotic training was deeply involved with psychoanalysis and Dan would be I think by many people's uh, standards described as a wild analyst in the psychoanalytic tradition uh, and really uh, also like him and uh, sadly uh, I only learned like uh, maybe it was uh, 2015 was when I learned he had been doing uh, all this work on translating Bun. I only knew him as a psychoanalytic hypnosis guy. And I only studied with him from that perspective uh, in the 1990s quite a bit. Maybe uh, I took three or four workshops from him during that time on hypnoanalysis and how we use uh, the practices of hypnosis. Um, so at any rate, uh, that's the one thing I really respect about him regardless of what's happening. Uh, it's really amazing. He's one of the few people who has really done a very high level of practice, not just theorizing uh, in the tradition of hypnosis and also now in the history of bone. And I've yet to be able to interact with him personally uh, though we have emailed back and forth, and even he kindly sent me some texts that he had translated in the Bun tradition, and we've shared uh, some emails. But really looking forward to, and does the COVID thing, you know, change? Or maybe if he does some online retreat, I really wants to go and be with him because uh, it's very strange. There's very few of us that have uh, done both of these traditions, you know, uh, at the kind of sort of highest level of practice, I guess, so to speak. Uh, so yeah, I really respect what he has to say. And that was actually my experience of what was happening uh, that day with Tony Nassif, my good Dharma buddy, uh, you know, a good Bunpa friend. Uh, that really was what made a deeper level of difference. And I had a, a strong sense about, uh, you know, maybe these things like rainbow body are true, you know, maybe maybe uh, this relationship between what I think and how it affects the energies of the body, uh, in which I was now feeling uh, flowing through me and feeling uh, so, uh, hmm. What were you feeling? What is it? What were you feeling? A deep sense of uh, well-being that was not dependent on anything, nothing. It's like this, not dependent on anything. Uh, and when you said that you felt the energies flowing through you, yeah, um, these energies felt like well-being um, in specific locations on specific channels, uh, yeah. congregating in certain centers. So you could mm -hmm. feel the subtle anatomy uh, yeah. come alive for, mm -hmm. during this practice. It had this flavor of well-being. Is that what you're saying? Definitely, yeah. Um, kind of like... Um, Yeah, it's, it's thought that these wisdom energies innately exist, you know, and uh, 
only uh, grasping on self and grasping on the world uh, sort of blocks their flow. And so, uh, yeah, I really felt like uh, there was an innate space in that this innate space uh, had a relationship to what was happening with uh, my body. Is that sense of equanimity that you mm -hmm. experienced, is that what they call in Dzogchen Rigpa, the sort of thing one would perhaps be classically introduced to with pointing out instructions, yeah. bit, which is a little bit, you know, I think where you yeah. compare to that yeah. sort of thing to um, hypnosis, very interesting. Yeah. Um, and then one is sort of encouraged to hold the view and there's various practices in, in order to do that. Is, mm -hmm. is that what you're describing? Would you call that oh. Rigpa? I believe so. Thank you. Yeah, I do really do believe that. Um, and that's the way I relate to it. And also, for this reason, um, I try not to relate to these experiences with too much uh, fixation, you know, yeah. like, um, and also, to me, it's like, uh, they're like, uh, there's a little bit of playfulness about this, you know, like, uh, so I don't mean this overly dualistically, but it's a little bit like, hey, dummy, you know, <laughs> it's like, actually, this is so much easier, you know, or this kind of thing and everything. But it really has more like emotionally, like a quality, like, uh, uh, <laughs> it's really, this is probably also too overly dualistic to say, but how, you know, I relate to it, I guess, like, uh, like everything's going to be all right, you know, like a, a good, uh, Bob Marley song, everything gonna be all right, <laughs> everything gonna be all right, no self, no cry, you know, or something, <laughs> shunyata, <laughs> uh, so yeah, it's really, uh, it's really wonderful, and I'm so grateful, you know, and like that sometimes has, people ask cool. me, like, why I feel devotion to lineage, um, it's cause uh, how, how did I get so damn lucky? You know that I was able to meet uh, these wonderful teachers and who are willing to work with me as I am, uh, even with all my rough edges and difficulties that I <laughs> present as a student. I'm sure, uh, you know, how lucky and uh, that everything karmically kept ar ar arising and still does. You know, it's, uh, I was still going. You know. Uh, uh, even that I've been able to bring uh, professionally this all together and there's a place like Naropa University, uh, ironically, you know, started by you know, Tragyam Trungpa Rinpoche for this exact purpose and the lineage where, you know, I'm not taking uh, higher teachings, but I still feel devotion to helping with, uh, you know, their uh, meditation. Basic, I feel like they teach meditation practice very well there. And so I like to help them with that. Um, so I said, yeah, how lucky am I? All this came together in this uh, amazing way, you know, it's really, uh, and they don't mind me doing hypnosis research there. And uh, they don't mind me comparing uh, hypnosis and the Dharma. Actually, they encourage that in particular. Uh, it just feels so uh, fortunate, you know, that um, all these things arrive. And so that's where my devotion comes. Uh, it's really based on uh, the benefit I've received and wanting, uh, to share that benefit with as many people as possible. And all of these teachers that I've mentioned and uh, others that uh, come later on uh, that I work with as well, in particularly in the bone lineage, they've all encouraged me to continue doing these uh, investigations and writings. Uh, and then also with the same guideline that I got, particularly in great depth, uh, Tenzin Wang Kiao Ren went, said, you know, we're, uh, not combining the methods, but uh, really talking about the view and encouraging people to do the practices the way we would like in remake. First, you must master each tradition separately. Mm -hmm. And so uh, I don't feel like I'm there myself. I feel like very grateful for what I've received and it's been really profound, you know. But uh, I guess until someone says, you know, I should start teaching some of these things in Bun, which, you know, I don't feel I'm there. Uh, then I probably, uh, I do like to help with those things, you know, like I help uh, arrange retreats and things. And I was empowered to teach uh, 
Salung, and I was empowered to teach uh, Shamatha and Shine and things like that. And be by, by Tenzin Wangyal. Yeah, by Tenzin Wangyal. Uh, and uh, particularly uh, some other teachers too, uh, mm-hmm. like uh, uh, Ten- Tenpa Yungdrung Rinpoche, who's the uh, head of a monastery, a bone monastery in Kathmandu, uh, near Saiwan Bodnath uh, Stupa. And uh, also Geshe Yungdrung uh, Rinpoche, who uh, by great fashion lives in Denver. And so I get to be with him a lot. It's really nice. And uh, Geshe Yungdrung knew three masters that obtained the rainbow body. So uh, he's a very uh, wonderful and fortunate person. And uh, so yeah, all of them have given me this advice. You know, what I'm doing is good, continue, uh, but you know, be careful. Uh, about you know not going too far too fast and so uh, I have great devotion to the lineage out of the benefit I've received and so that I don't go beyond their advice and feel that that's good but you know someday you know who knows Uh, maybe not me I'm curious Uh, presumably you uh, told Tenzin Wange Rinpoche about that experience and he uh, verified it I'm curious what that conversation was like I'm also uh, curious how this experience of Rigpa mm-hmm. had any, if, if any effect or how it interacts when you have to do cognitive work, including uh, future planning, past recall, but also in depth cognitive work, which of course is part of your career. I'm curious about that interaction. And I'm also curious, and I understand mm-hmm. there's more biography to come, but I'm also curious what it would, what would need to happen other than a teacher telling you you were ready for you to feel like you were ready to teach you said you don't feel you're there yet what yeah. what is what is the uh d- what is the territory between here and there right that's a good question uh well you asked really good questions yeah <laughs> man uh i'm actually going to write this down a little bit so i don't forget the first yeah. part while i'm going to the second one but, uh, <laughs> I'm glad we did that, you know, and uh, your little organization. And it's even like, I think, an example of that, actually, right? You know, it's like, uh, uh, I feel like sometimes, right, when uh, someone is giving me an interview or something, like, I want to come off like this is really cool, you know, put together kind of guy, and, uh, and not give myself the space to, like, actually honor uh, what's... Uh, the question that was being answered. And so instead of like uh, just going into it in a seamless kind of way, I was happy to open the space so that I could really think about, you know. Yep. Uh, so I feel like uh, this all has to do with, you know, uh, this powerful nature of emptiness about our experiences. And so that uh, profound experience of Rigpa makes more space to do what is actually right in the circumstance. So like, there there was an example, like I I don't, I actually loved your question enough not to feel like I had to, you know, go into this thing where I look so cool and I never forget a question or anything. I feel like that it makes more space to actually notice the circumstances I'm in, or even to notice what I don't notice about them and then look some more. So I feel like the that was actually a fairly you know decent understanding uh, experience of what I think how Rigpa does not actually uh, negate in a nihilistic world way the uh, experience of the illusion of the world, but actually makes uh, it richer in, in in a way with less grasping that actually is more possible to do be of more benefit to others in my in my own self development that actually. Uh, we need not think about this in some dualistic way, like uh, emptiness is going to, you know, destroy the world, <laughs> like some nuclear bomb of of uh, Junyata, you know, uh, or even the self. You know, I feel like um, these things are naturally arising from that potential field of wis- wisdom and love. Uh, and so that uh, as long as I'm willing to open that space, that I will then be able to appreciate the circumstances of myself and of the illusion of the world without so much grasping 
that I can like really let things be as they are with myself and with uh, others. And so I feel like that's the, how uh, really uh, no opposition to cognitive uh, analysis and require, I think actually is better <laughs> cognitive analysis, you know, is less of this, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, dualistic pressure you know, about having to make things work in a certain way and instead of dealing with them as they are. Wanting things to be a certain way is the surest way to screw them up, I've often noticed, you know. I think it's good to have a goal and a plan. Even this other question you asked me, like, what would be the point where I would go, okay, now it is time for this uh, grander conjunction between these traditions. And I think, actually, that would arrive in a circumstance. <laughs> you know, like there would be something as little like, uh, um, and even a, you're asking this question is kind of a circumstance leading to that. You know, I think, you know, it's like uh, all these great uh, Buddhist uh, scriptures, you know, where, you know, they describe, you know, some, you know, Shariputra or someone asking the Buddha a question and then the circumstance of the question then becomes a fabulous uh, talk and explanation on the view. And so I think there will be a circumstance that makes that happen. Um, and the one that's always occurred to me is that someone has actually reached a very high level of both being a, a teacher in the hypnosis tradition and a very high level of being a, a teacher in the uh, Bunpo or some other Dzogchen uh, tradition. I think that's one circumstance that to me seems clear. Uh, and so, you know, uh, Dan Brown's pretty darn close, isn't he? <laughs> you know, he's pretty darn close. Uh, and so I think something like that. Uh, another one that occurs to me and that uh, sometimes I've dreamed uh, that uh, maybe some Bun Tokyo or something, you know, uh, that's, you know, being, uh, being trained, maybe like I could be like a, hypnosis teacher to some bon Tokyo, <laughs> you know, sometimes I thought that would be good. I've actually not said that to any of my Tibetan teachers. Maybe this is a reminder that actually I would <laughs> just offer that. I think that would be another way something like that could happen. In terms of me doing it, I think it would be uh, that one of my teachers asked me to begin uh, teaching, you know, something uh, you know, did give, begin giving actual Dzogchen and teachings and empowering me to uh, do things beyond what I'm doing in terms of uh, these preliminary practices. Uh, um, other than that, I'm not sure. Maybe some other circumstances could arise too, but those are the ones that come to my mind. Uh, and I feel like I'm being of benefit to enough people doing what I'm doing. Uh, but, you know, I evaluate that, you know, and uh, your question uh, is so amazing to me. Uh, it is at the, at the center, you know, my heart center. Uh, you're, this question you've asked me about when that would arrive, what would that look like? Uh, I think about that uh, a lot, uh, both in terms of as a discipline about not going too far too fast, but also uh, I deeply think that would be really super cool. <laughs> you know, it's really beneficial. Uh, so I'm looking forward to that. And really all my writings are about building something that could be used uh, to do that. You know, maybe like John the Baptist before Jesus or something. <laughs> you know, I'm like doing what I'm doing to build something that, you know, there will be writings that someone else could use. You know, there would be to describe, you know, the relationship between hypnosis and view of Dzogchen, uh, even the science of it that, you know, they'll be able to use that when I'm doing, you know, there's a bridge uh, and they'll, you know, hopefully they're doing more too. Uh, maybe we can get Dan Brown to start doing that, what I'm doing as well. Actually, that's one of Dan Brown is listening to this someday. <laughs> Yay, wouldn't that be wonderful? <laughs> and uh, maybe even we'll do something together. Uh, so wonderful. I, uh, I think it, those are my thoughts at this point. Yeah, that's very fascinating. What about, um, and I know we still have uh, this, the first question there, but what about um, mm -hmm. personality patterns, say yeah. procrastination or yeah. say alcoholism? 
uh, or something like this. You've talked about how the anxiety is transformed yeah. into the energy is yeah. still there, but without the thought associations with it. What yeah. about things like quote unquote problems that one might report maybe in a clinical setting as a problem? I'm just curious how Rick in, interacts with that, that sort of thing. Yeah, your question is really good. And it also reveals uh, the current area of my ability to overlap the traditions of hypnosis and, uh, you know, Bon and Dzogchen uh, and Tibetan Buddhism in general. Because I, there is one area of overlap that, uh, so wow, thank you for pointing this out. Uh, this question is so good. Uh, and that's around Salung practice. Because I was empowered to teach Tibetan yoga in Salung. And the, my, uh, you know, Tenpa, uh, Yungdrung Rinpoche and Geshe Yungdrung Rinpoche and Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche all gave me uh, permission to teach Tibetan yoga, particularly at Naropa University. I have a little Tibetan yoga group, which unfortunately COVID has disrupted. Um, first, because I had it, but that's another story. <laughs> but uh, I, that's how I really see the potential here is around how do we work with these deep-seated patterns of personality that are in fact involved uh, with so many things, alcoholism, anxiety, uh, you know, anything. There's always you know, the symptom the person is experiencing and then there's the person that's experiencing the symptom and how they're reifying and magnifying these things. Otherwise the symptoms that just disappear, you know, there's no fixation around them. So personality is very important for why we fixate on suffering. That's at least my uh, kind of simple way of understanding. Why is personality, you know, important? You know, if, if there's emptiness to self, why is personality important? It's because that personality is fixating on certain aspects of reality and keeping those, you know, uh, hmm, those energies, you know, those, uh, delusory views keep going, you know, through that kind of fixation. And so here's where there's a possibility of not just working with the mind using normal therapy, but what Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche loves to talk about, you know, instead of working with the mind to help the mind, we'll work with the body to work with the mind. And so this is what he talks about a lot with the Tibetan yoga, you know, which is the, you know, way we describe Sa Lung to, uh, most people around the United States. I can't remember who was the first person to start doing that, but it, it, um, I don't know how long this uh, has been going. It may have been Namki Norbu or something like this. Uh, but at any rate, in terms of transmission of bun and Tibetan yoga, it's definitely Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche in the United States. And so he teaches uh, Tibetan yoga to anyone, uh, anyone who wants to learn. Uh, and has empowered his students to teach, uh, well, not all of the, you know, Salung practices, of course, but he's found uh, a certain um, uh, exercises that work predictably well for people with all different backgrounds and also different levels of physical ability. So it's not like, you know, we're doing all the crazy ones where you jump up in the air and all that uh, with, uh, you know, most folks. Uh, but we really focus in on, uh, you know, a few practices that work very well and bring a lot of benefit to many people because it is possible to learn how to uh, work with the energy of uh, anger and anxiety through Salung practice and, you know, things like the nine breathings and really work with and liberate the innate wisdoms of each of the um, energy centers to then... Uh, there is less fixation there. You know, that's what I understand personality to be in this way, uh, thinking about the view of, of uh, uh, Dzogchen and uh, how it relates to Salung practice, that these personality fixations arise from specific energy centers, from the chakras. So you could have a fiery personality, so to speak, you know, the, this kind of thing. Um, or you could need more space. You know, you could need you know, more space, you could need, you know, more uh, compassion, you know, and more earth qualities. So all of this even then uh, comes into a kind of, you know, to get back into the shamanistic tradition of uh, Bun in particular, 
you know, there's an elemental analysis of how these different chakras relate to the different elements. And so these different elements uh, and different, you know, psychological experiences, you know, according to the six realms of existence, this kind of thing, um, all of this makes up a kind of uh, psychology and people may have fixations in different energy centers that produce different, uh, by the way, this is very much like what Wilhelm Reich, the great psychoanalyst was always talking about, it's terrible that he developed syphilis at the end of his life and that it was not detected until he was so uh, crazy uh, by that point uh, with the, you know, dementia. Because he was also talking about this, that he said that all of our personality patterns and fixations had to do with fixations on particular parts of the body. Uh, at any rate, um, but so this is, you know, the view uh, of uh, Dzogchen, uh, and I relate this to personality theory. I really believe that actually is true. And um, so the wonderful thing is that I have been empowered to teach Salung. And so I actually teach uh, Tibetan yoga uh, to all of my clients uh, as a way of kind of working and developing the ground, right, to have these experiences of Rigpa, as you can rightly named that uh, you really can, anyone can have this, you know? And uh, Tenzin Wangyal, you know, he's really focused on practices that could bring benefit to anyone. You know, even they don't have this uh, amazing background and understanding uh, the philosophy of mind that emerges from these topics. Uh, you don't know about how karma relates to, um, you know, a blocking of the energies and this kind of thing and the psychology of that, you just do the practice. You just do these practices and uh, you will spontaneously have these good feelings of uh, openness. Uh, and I think that's when it becomes very useful to study the philosophies, because then you have some words to, you know, dualistic words that helps you uh, to relate to this non-dual experiences you're having. And then, you know, I feel like this uh, deepens even more you know, the, the view. And uh, so I have been empowered to do that. And I really enjoy in particular, like around issues of substance abuse and someone who maybe has issues of anger or like any issue at all. Like we, I do these practices with people to help them to connect with this space and to achieve some peace very quickly. Uh, you know, it's really, um, when working with the uh, clients, uh, I uh, am always focused to bring as much benefit as quickly as possible at the beginning, because that there is a predictable thing we know from psychotherapy research that about three weeks after a person begins uh, counseling or psychotherapy, they will have a dip in their symptoms. They'll actually get worse. And usually in the case of depression, that's when the person has really opened to the therapy and is actually now seen in greater detail just how much suffering they have. They've developed enough openness to like actually and feel safe maybe in the context of therapy that they really look at the full picture and just see how how much more fucked up <laughs> they are than they realize. And so at that time, I really want to have something going on with them where there's something new, you know, like a Tibetan yoga, meditation, self-hypnosis practice uh, that will allow them to uh, kind of have those experiences and receive some feeling of encouragement. It's something uh, new in their experience arises, even if, you know, paradoxically, they've had these abilities their whole life. You know, it feels like there is something new, even though from my perspective, there's nothing new about that. They've had that potential all along. Uh, but uh, they've not arrived at those moments of less fixation on the self. They've not arrived at less grasping on the world. And so we can work that both from the therapy in terms of, you know, me pointing out the dreamlike nature of these things through my therapy. If we want to think of it that way. A lot of therapy is like that, even if it's not said that way. Actually, we do say stuff like that in the hypnosis world. Um, in transpersonal psychology world, we do say that. Um, but um, also through practices of the body that allow these things to happen, even, you know, uh, 
you not have to, you know, work with the mind at all. You could just do this more from the psychophysiological way of, you know, salung and then leading into what, what we were talking about with uh, uh, Tumo. You know, Tumo really builds from what you learn in uh, salung Tibetan yoga, really very important. Uh, though I didn't know that at the time, actually. <laughs> I just, luckily, I had already been doing salung quite a bit before I started Tumo. Um, so that is one area where I really uh, see, like right now, uh, it is possible to, uh, for me, I have been empowered to teach uh, Tibetan yoga. And so now I teach to all my clients uh, that uh, want to learn. And uh, sometimes I talk about that uh, Tibetan uh, uh, saying, you know, that says, uh, uh, like trying to work with the, clean the mind, using the mind is like, uh, trying to wash the bloodied hands with blood. I love these Tibetan sayings. They're so, you know, earthy, like, oh, I got blood on my hands, you know. Trying to wash the bloodied hand with blood. And, uh, uh, ooh, you know, bloodied hands. You know. Who have you murdered, you know? <laughs> Yourself, I guess, you know. And uh, uh, so I really, uh, I like that perspective. Like, Let's not just work with our mind and, uh, you know, using our speech and talking and giving self-understanding that way. Let's also work with the, uh, the energies of the body that maintain the mind and that allow us to uh, discover the innately existing uh, space of that nature of mind. You know, let's, and so Salung and, uh, uh, yeah, I was empowered to teach that and uh, enjoy that so much. Uh, that is the one thing that I'm, I'm doing that actually crosses over. So thanks for that question, actually. Uh, really wonderful. <laughs> that's right where I'm at currently. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting indeed. Perhaps we can go back then to your conversation with Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche. I assume you told him about this experience, mm -hmm. this Rigpa. Yeah transformative Rigpa experience at the Tuma retreat. Uh, what was what went down in that conversation? It's really funny. Everything with him, his wonderful sense of humor, wonderful sense of space. He can be incredibly serious at times, like super serious, particularly around describing practice and importance of practice. He'll be very, you know, serious. But he's never far from his sense of humor. Never far uh, very open and loving uh, kind of guy and uh, also can be a little uh, trickster like you know and so my conversation with him hap around that experience happened around uh, something that happened on that retreat which was uh, utterly hilarious uh, and that was on this retreat uh, during since there was no prohibition given about you know you shouldn't this should be a silent retreat. Uh, and we're all, well, maybe not all, <laughs> I don't know. I, feel, I don't know, I have no idea. I only know my own experience and who I talk to. A lot of us were experiencing a lot of opening and benefit from this. And uh, during the dinner time, when I would be sitting with my, my friend Tony and some other wonderful people, we became very childlike at times and began like, a, you know, making many, many jokes, you know, and just really uh, joyful. And it seemed that this spaciousness was following into this, uh, you know, dining experience. And even to the point where one day it, it became a food fight. <laughs> it was like it was all these, you know, serious Dharma practitioner, you know, and then here we're having food fight, you know, and actually Rinpoche, uh, you know, uh, someone went to Ribeche and complained, you know, about us, you know, uh, that, you know, there were these unruly, you know, students, you know, and they're disturbing, like how wild we were or something. Uh, and also noting that, um, eh, there is a woman also who uh, is actually joyfully became my third wife, uh, though we're not together anymore, sadly, uh, but that's okay. 
she was sitting next to me during one of these, uh, there was a number of these two-mo retreats, but someone was complaining uh, that during the practice, she made too much noise. Because the, during the out-breath and the two-mo, sometimes she made this sound that was like, ah. <laughs> you know, not like super loud, but you know, she did do this a little bit. And uh, so someone went to Ripache and was complaining about these crazy people. You know, and they're making noise during the practice and they're feeling blissful noise, you know, and disturbing them. They can't uh, focus on the practice because, ah. And also they were having food fights and uh, acting very wild and insane. Uh, no, all of us who did this also were doing very, very austere things, I should say. Like, I don't want to make it sound like we were only this way. Uh, also, uh, these are the people we were spend most of our time when not at dinner uh, throwing food at each other. We were doing a lot of guru yoga and a lot of prostrations. We were not even being asked to do this. We were just doing it, just really. So there was, you know, it's not just stuck in one range. It's the whole thing. And so she asked Rinpoche, you know, you know, what should I, you know, can you do something about these crazy people? And then uh, he said to her, maybe you should be more like these people. <laughs> and then she came and she totally got it. And she came and said, how much did we had bothered her and how useful it had been this happened. And then she became one of us too, you know, it's wonderful. She started being playful and wonderful and uh, it's really wonderful. And so it was in that context, I go to meet him, you know, and uh, talk with him during that retreat. And, uh, so I'm trying to remember, uh, he's really talking about this thing, you know, about um, this kind of non-dual aspect, you know, of uh, hmm, this uh, opening, you know, of, of wisdom, you know, experience of Rigpa. And um, it's just encouraging, you know, and he actually, you know, uh, tells me the same story about what happened from his point of view, you know. And so, you know, he sort of uh, describes that, uh, you know, uh, this is a good thing and uh, continue uh, practicing. And um, we also, we begin uh, talks again about uh, not uh, going beyond uh, at the, that point, you know, uh, what I was uh, empowered to do in terms of bringing these things together. Uh, but yeah, it's just really encouraging and, um, uh, Not long after that, I, I would say uh, maybe like five years later or something was when uh, I uh, was sort of asked uh, by him and by uh, other students he was working with student uh, group leaders to be get involved with the teaching of uh, the bun and to help organize the teachings and do you know simple things like uh, send out newsletters and emails and do all the simple things and then uh, people learned, you know, I'm a professor and I'm good at, you know, introducing teachers and, you know, kind of running the schedule of retreats and getting involved in that way. And, uh, and then eventually even, um, you know, I got empowered to teach uh, some things so I could run meditation groups where I lived uh, to be helpful in terms of, because uh, Tenzin Rangel is always very, powerfully saying, you know, it's so important to remain practicing. And so they wanted me to be helpful in that. Like actually I could help lead practice sessions from, you know, my ability to do that. And uh, so I would say, yeah, he's just always been uh, very uh, reaffirming and acknowledging. And it was actually, um, maybe also, yeah, about five years later, uh, in fact, it was exactly four years later, four years later, that I re first received pointing out instructions from Tenzin Wangyal Rinpoche. And uh, so uh, that was really wild because, yeah, I felt like uh, my ability to receive what he was doing there 
uh, it was like reaffirming also the experience of Rig Pride had during Tumo and also holding of the orange, you know, <laughs> going back to Trungpa days and minding the gap, you know, in meditation. So, um, yeah, I've just been very fortunate to have had him as a teacher. Also, he led me to uh, studying with Tenpa Yungdrung Rinpoche and uh, Geshe Yungdrung Rinpoche I met through Tenpa Yungdrung. And so lucky Geshe Yungdrung lives in Denver and uh, get to be with him. Um, and Tenpa Yungdrung's sister lives uh, uh, in uh, Denver area. And uh, he comes uh, quite frequently. And uh, for a while, he was coming as much as twice a year. So just uh, so ideal, like this, uh, so lucky. And it's so amazing that, you know, uh, this desire that I had to want to study with uh, a teacher more intensively around Dzogchen practice and, you know, higher teachings. Um, I have been really lucky. I have one teacher that actually lives uh, in Denver. I have another one that comes and visits, uh, you know, as much as twice a year, less now because obviously what's going on. Uh, but he's been teaching a lot on the internet, actually. That's wonderful. Uh, and then uh, Tenzin Wangyal is, you know, got even the cyber Sangha thing going many years ago. And so I get to interact with him a lot. It's wonderful. And then also he comes to a retreat center that we have here in Colorado and uh, called a Crestone, Colorado. It's a very beautiful place. And so I've been involved uh, with that. And uh, so, uh, yeah, that's where I'm at with uh, my current practice is really uh, enjoying uh, relating to these practices that they've been teaching. And, uh, and then arrived at this place where I felt like I had learned enough about the nature of mind and how uh, these practices that I study in this other lineage that I belong to, the hypnosis lineage, are so related in terms of uh, the phenomenology of what one experiences in the practices are very similar. And I feel there's a dramatic similarity in the kind of methods that we use in hypnosis the, uh, in uh, Dzogchen. And also we know uh, from at least our uh, studies that the neuroscience of these things are very similar. And I can compare that. And then the views of the mind are so similar. And it's like almost like, you know, Ernest Hilgard and Jack Watkins and other people in the hypnosis lineage had studied Dzogchen. You know, it seems strange. And uh, of course, I know that they didn't because I knew them. You know, the, I was also very fortunate to know so many powerful hypnosis teachers. And, and the really powerful hypnosis teachers, not the ones that said, I am the master teacher of hypnosis. I have the secrets of hypnosis. You know, even people wrote this book, Secrets of Hypnosis, Master Secrets of Suggestion, and all this crazy, you know, puffery. Uh, real nature of hypnosis has almost nothing to do with suggestion in that way. Uh, not at all. Um, and so I knew the real teachers that studied the science of hypnosis. And really, the science of hypnosis made them humble, as opposed to these other crazy people going around uh, trying to manipulate people. Uh, not even, a lot of things they do, not even really what I would think of as hypnosis, is really uh, utilizing other phenomena. Um, uh, at any rate, um, so... I assume you're talking about NLP. Yeah, yeah it's a... NLP is a little actually mixed in that way, in that some people have actually been genuinely interested in NLP from a scientific perspective. Even myself, I once attempted to uh, validate some of the scientific, uh, some of the observations of NLP theory. You know, the, the original source of NLP is, you know, not Richard Bandler, you know, and John Grinder, it's uh, Milton Erickson. And it, what they were so good at was explaining what Erickson did, you know, uh, and even they say that in their original books, you know, and then of course they invented their own things and ways of understanding things. But, you know, uh, Erickson was never actually very, Milton Erickson, the great, uh, you know, uh, medical hypnotist and psychiatrist is really good at all aspects of hypnosis. Uh, it's actually not very good at describing his own theory of what he does or, 
uh, he did provide a very powerful way of teaching hypnosis to other people. And he was actually more interested in that, like teaching people, clients, and also therapists and other uh, medical professionals, and even anthropologists. You know, he taught hypnosis. Uh, anyone who had some genuine interest in hypnosis and an application, he liked teaching practices. He was not really good at describing the theory of what hypnosis was, but from my point of view. He did have kind of a psychoanalytic thing, uh, but from my point of view, um, I don't know. I, I feel like uh, NLP was an advancement in that, that actually they were attempting to provide uh, kind of finishing Erickson's thoughts on theory. But the problem was that actually that had none of Erickson's humility, which is really horrible and really dark. I uh, really, for this reason, uh, don't feel that great about NLP and uh, really saw, you know, like um, some of these figures that really uh, very powerful egos, almost like, like a, a you know, an <laughs> uh, uh, achievement of what Chaga and Trungpa Rinpoche called a uh, Rudra hood, you know, like totally like realized a high state of the illusion of ego is like almost like a supreme accomplishment. <laughs> you know, you could be a little proud in a paradoxical way, achieved full rudrahood, you know, through NLP or something. Uh, so I, you know, I, I will definitely give them their due in that they've done some good things. But I try not to be too dualistic about what they've done that's good and that's bad. Uh, but yeah, I don't recommend because of, uh, they're not like uh, Dharma teachers who are really focused on uh, emptiness of self much. Uh, they feel like uh, they're really went in the opposite direction. <laughs> you know, they're really, you know, fully established. Uh, this is crazy egos. It's interesting. I think this is something that also can happen in sort of spiritual or Dharma circles. Is mm -hmm. that sometimes the software comes with the maker's mark, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know, and you have to um, l take that as well as the benefit, and yeah. that seems like a subtle compromise uh, mm -hmm. that might do more harm than the thing that it's being is being fixed. Almost a s subtle sort of thraldom uh, can yeah. can occur. Boy, you have provided a really good metaphor for that. The software comes with the maker's mark. Yeah, that is, that's really profound. Uh, and I guess it also has something to do with, uh, you know, this deep sense of humility that I believe uh, practice helps one, you know, less fixation on the self. No one has to particularly tell you that. Um, although, you know, actually, I think it's pretty obvious, you know, how, you know, some of these great masters uh, that are really gentle you know, people and uh, such humility. And even when we were talking last time, like uh, one of these great manuals of Christian mysticism, the cloud of unknowing, this author, like realized that at like such a high level that not signed their name. I would, that's the, how I understand this, you know, like, uh, and I try, uh, even like I was just saying now, like any misunderstandings I'm, communicating in this, uh, this is my own, you know, and um, I try to be very uh, humble about this. And uh, I feel like it's very important to encourage everyone to uh, experience the software that's being transmitted uh, from their own perspective and uh, to put their own maker's mark, you know, so to speak, uh, Although ironically, that would be kind of like an empty maker's mark, you know. <laughs> you know. Uh, well, Ian, I think we might be once again oh, uh, right, running yeah. out of time. So here, here's my proposal. I think we yeah. should do a third one. Yeah, uh, let's do. Okay, if you're up for it, that's great. Because something that I'm going to tease for the listeners yeah. and, the, and viewers is that, in fact, you, uh, as you as you mentioned, did indeed contract COVID nineteen and had a cacophony of neurological consequences that almost killed you. And yeah. so I think it would be very interesting in the context of what we've been discussing to yeah. uh, look at that. And also we still haven't quite got to some of the, the details of, of your academic work. 
And there are yeah. two, or three, two or three things, I think, that in the context of maybe a, a trio or what do they call it, a triptych? Triptych, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Uh, we could, we could uh, bring in to, to round out uh, a sort of mini series, I guess it is now. Uh, if you're up for that, I think that'd be great. Oh, I'd love to. And also, I will further tease that uh, the prophecy I received from Lama Dawa uh, Chodrak Rinpoche has echoed throughout the rest of my life, even to this day. And uh, many powerful experiences have happened that I'd be glad to share as a tribute to Lama Dawa, uh, even to the point where uh, I got found myself uh, nearly driving off a cliff in Sikkim. <laughs> <laughs> okay. We've been Hearing the voice of uh, Dharma protectors uh, leaving Gantek, uh, Rumtek Monastery. So yeah, I couldn't uh, share these things uh, as well because uh, those divinations have uh, parts that I believe are still, you know, comes. But they, wow. yeah, is divinations are uh, really powerful. I'm happy to share those too. Fantastic. I will look forward to it. Ian, thank you very much. No, thank you so much. Thank you so much, good friend. <laughs> thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.